Winter is coming and the dead are restless. East Watch Season 7, Episode 5. Reminder, I do not do spoiler-free reviews for this show anymore, so let's get right to it. A bit of a slower episode following the definitely the very rousing action scene we got at the end of the previous one, and normally I'd complain about that, the show having kind of peaked and now dipping, except it didn't bother me as much this time as it would normally. I think that has to do with the fact that even though this was a very set-up kind of episode for what's going to be the last two episodes of the season, it, it worked for me because the stuff that they were setting up was not stuff that I would have necessarily called in advance. Like the whole idea that this team is going to go up north of the wall to try and capture a single white to show to Cersei to get her support. I wouldn't have called that. So, that, so setting that up, it was interesting watching those pieces get moved into that position. Normally set up episodes just feel like very, not like we always know it's coming, but it feels like, okay, you're doing this because you have to, because if you don't do this, you skip a step, but it's going where we know it's going. In this case, it's not. It was setting up stuff that was not stuff I called in advance. That said, I did call exactly how this episode was going to start with Braun dragging Jamie out of the water. I love Braun so much. And I, I think it's probably not foreshadowing with his line to Jamie. No, no one gets to kill you except me. But I love that line. I thought that was great. And from Braun, that just felt absolutely perfect. The other character who came pretty close to stealing the show was Davos. I loved him sort of landing in King's Landing. First of all, I love that he found Gendry. We finally get resolution on Gendry. And I love that Davos' line was, oh, well, I guess you're not still rowing. Because that was the last thing we saw him do in season two. So uh, that was a cute, fun nod. And I like seeing Davos, you know, bribe the guards and work. Just watch him sort of work that magic and work that charm because, you know, we've gotten little hints here and there about what his life was like as a smuggler before he, you know, sort of found a cause. And it's, it's just fun to realize, man, he was really good at that. Sir Jorah's back. He's now regained his position with Daenerys, sort of, and he's been sent off on mission, and I still don't know if it was worth it or not. I'm still holding reservation there. I mean, let me put it this way. Their reunion was nowhere nearly as touching as their departure had been. So right now, him coming back is, it, it's accumulating a debt that they need to pay off, because if they don't, I'm just going to throw my hands up and go, we didn't need him to come back. But we'll see where that goes. Man, Sam has it rough. He's really, really trying, and I feel bad for him. That said, God, how painful was that moment with Gilly reading, and you know she's she's reading something that is so important, and Sam just doesn't isn't paying attention. And it's so it's so hard because that's so unlike him. He's just too frustrated in that moment. Although you know, with somebody you know giving us all that key information, I think we should be lucky that the finger of God didn't come down and smote her mid-sentence the way this show tends to go sometimes. I want to circle back onto Tyrion. I think he's really starting to second-guess his allegiance with Daenerys. I think he probably still does believe that she is the best option of what's out there right now, but boy, you can, you can see it, especially with his interaction with Varys, who was also great this episode. Just, it's weighing on him like, what did I sign up for? Who am I backing? Who am I helping? And the show is doing a pretty good job of laying out the reasons why Daenerys getting what she wants may not be a good thing in a way that doesn't betray the character. Because it would have been very easy to like have her start to really gain momentum and like just the power corrupts her. It was like, no, she's acting in a way completely consistent with how we've seen her act. It's just that up until recently, she was, you know, having this attitude against a city of slavers and, you know, these people who, who we as an audience have no investment in. But now she's in Westeros and she's dealing with people who, I mean, maybe we didn't like. I mean, she burned, you know, it's Sam's dad and his son, who we only just met, but this is a world that we've seen people struggle over. We know how this world works better, and we kind of, as an audience, have more investment in it and the people in it, even if we don't know the specific individuals. So watching her steamroll these people the same way that she did with a place like Slaver's Bay, it's starting to sink in, oh, she's not adjusting. She's not tweaking her approach because she's now in Westeros. 
Oh dear. And I think it's, I, I personally feel they're doing a good job of laying those doubts for Tyrion and sort of by proxy for the audience about you know, what is it we want to have happen. It's a tougher call than it appeared at first. Especially with Cersei laying as low as she is right now. She's not stirring up all that much crap. Uh, but she is going to have another kid. That Okay. I'm not even entirely sure what to make of that one. I, I suppose it does rule out um, my earlier call that Jamie was going to be the one to kill her. I think if she's carrying his kid, that's definitely not going to happen. And of course, we've got Littlefinger stirring up crap in Winterfell. Man, this guy plans long term. Or I don't know if, if it's that he plans long term. He, he knows what to hang on to. He knows what's probably going to be helpful later. I mean, I, I'm glad he's around. He is, he is aggravating in a really thrilling way, but... Oh, it's going to be so good to see him get his because he needs to. So I suppose the the big thing sort of left to do, because like I said, uh, this was a largely a set up episode. There were some nice little moments, some nice little reveals, but I personally didn't feel that there was a big, oh, but you know, a lot of good moments. I like the dragon facing down John and, and all of that. But I think the last thing to talk about is this team headed north of the wall. What's going to go on there? Well, first of all, uh, I tried to figure out, okay, who's going to die? There's no way that they're all coming back. And when I started to think about that, I actually stopped that thought process part way through. Although, for the record, I expect at least one of the Brothers Without Banners to die, if not both of them. The rest of the ones, is, it's a tougher call for me, but here's, here's what I want to see. I want to see something unusual happen either to the members of this party or in terms of the behavior of the Whites or the White Walkers themselves in regards to the fact that two of the members of this party have died and come back to life. And I would be kind of disappointed if the fact that they are effectively walking dead men, but are not like the Army of the Dead, I would be disappointed if that does not factor in somehow. Because like you, you sent two guys, two guys up there who have died and come back, one of them repeatedly. And they're going up against, you know, and, deal, and dealing with these things that raise the dead. Like, this has to come up. The, I, I don't know how. I don't know how it's going to factor in. I don't know if the if the White Walkers are going to just react weirdly, weirdly toward them. I don't know if they're, like, going to feel a pull to start, you know, to possibly serve the, the Night's King. I don't know, but something. There's there's some there's got to be something to this. Oh, and I think uh, Tormund Giant Spain might not make it back either, which would be a real shame for me because I like him a lot. I would say Gendry's disposable, except we only just got him back, and it would seem weird to bring him back just to have him die. If either him or Jorah die, they got to go out in a semi spectacular fashion because in both cases they just brought him back, and it would be dumb to have him back just to die if they don't do something with it. Uh, Gendry swinging that hammer, I like that. I love a good war hammer. So I think that's about it. That's my thoughts on the episode. It was good. It was it. It was a less intense than the last episode, but I like what it's setting up. I like what it's building. I like. I'm really excited for the next episode, and I did actually enjoy this one in and of itself as well. So solid stuff. What were your thoughts on it? Whatever they are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. Don't forget to like, subscribe, check me out on Twitter at Council of Geeks. Give a listen to the Council of Geeks podcast or the Punch Like a Girl podcast, both available on iTunes and Stitcher. And until next time, this council is adjourned.